everyone. So unfortunately, there were some major issues with the recording this week. And uh, for some reason, it only captured a few seconds worth of video and absolutely no audio. So unfortunately, you're stuck with this freeze frame. And I'm going to go back over what we talked about uh, during last week's session. All right. I'll start in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So baptism. Uh, the very term brings to mind babies, white baptismal outfits, candles, probably maybe the Godfather, the movie. I don't know. Uh, but the truth of baptism is much more than our imaginations will allow us to see. Just to give a quick overview of what happens, original sin and personal sins are forgiven. We become a new life, a new child of God the Father, members of the body of Christ, temples of the Holy Spirit, members of the church, participants in the priesthood of Christ, and that's just to name a few. We're given a permanent character of being a Christian. And that's a, that's a lot. Those are a lot of big ideas, big words. But baptism has always included reading the word, reading the Bible, God's word, and the acceptance of the gospel, proclaiming baptism, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and Eucharistic communion. Even when baptism of infants became common, it was important that they be educated or you know, have an intense training in the teachings of the faith. In the Old Testament, baptism was seen in water, a source of life and death, water is. And it was in the story of Noah's Ark floating above death and sin in the water that the Israelites passing through the, uh, the water of the Red Sea and finally crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land. Those are just a few examples of where we see it in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, Jesus tells us in John's Gospel that a man must be born again and from above with both water and spirit in order to gain the kingdom of heaven. The Greek word John uses, and I might butcher this because I don't speak Greek, surprise, surprise, uh, but I believe it's pronounced enothen. And it carries this dual mean, meaning of being born again and born from above. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus instructs the apostles, uh, the first bishops of the church, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Also, when Peter was converting uh, the Jews, he asked all those who had come to believe in the truth of Christ to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is so important that it was in Matthew's gospel. It was like his mic drop moment. Like, that's the last lines in Matthew's gospel. Those are the last words that he thought were the most important to say. The water of baptism literally washes away all of our sin, especially our original sin. That, that mark that's left on our souls, inherited from our first parents when they decided to turn their hearts away from God's will. And that is something that actually uh, you'll get to hear about from Father Greg next week in the uh, 50 Truths videos. Because that's that's kind of crazy. Like, what's the deal with original sin? You know, why are we still paying for the sins of Adam and Eve all these, you know, however many years later? Well, Father Greg goes over that. And just to give you, like, a, a simple answer right now, it's not a, a real necessary uh, sin it's more of like a state of our souls, a state of our humanity is broken and corrupted uh, because of that, because of our just constant turning away from God that started with that first initial turn away. But he'll go over that more uh, and provide more insight into that. So you have that to look forward to for more answers. But baptism also washes away all of our personal sins, the sins that we have committed by our own free will. 
The water represents both the washing away of the death of sin and the nourishment of the new life in Christ, the new life from above. Through the power and grace of the sacrament of baptism, the divine presence dwelling within us, we are united with Christ's actions on the cross as well, believe it or not, which Jesus actually called his own baptism. His death on the cross is our death to sin. His resurrection is our resurrection. Our new life is his new life. St. Paul explains it like this. He says, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. This union with Christ, the Son of God, also unites us with the Father as his adopted children. Just after Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River, we hear the Father's voice from heaven proclaiming, You are my beloved Son. With you I am pleased. So too are we the Father's beloved. Like, listen to those words. Those are such powerful words. And loving words from a father. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. You are my beloved daughter. With you, I am well pleased. So too are we, the father's beloved. So too are we pleasing in the eyes of our heavenly father in our union with Christ through our baptism. United with Christ, we are not alone. We simply can't be. Union with Christ means union with the entire body of Christ, the church. St. Paul tells us we are members one another. We are members one of another because of our baptism. It's what incorporates us into the church. The bride of Christ is another name for the church. This new life means that we no longer live for ourselves, but live for the one who gave us new life. This is what makes us all members of the same church. Baptism leaves this mark on our soul. That means through baptism, a permanent change of the very essence of the individual takes place. Forever in this life and in the next, the the baptized soul is sealed with the mark of belonging to Christ. Sin can't erase this mark. Even if sin prevents the soul salvation in the end, nothing can erase this mark, not even turning away from God, not even deciding that you hate him or you don't believe in him. Forever, you have that mark on your soul. It's like like a tattoo times a million, basically. And it also means that baptism is only to be given once because of the nature of the sacrament. It lasts forever, so it never needs to be repeated. In our baptism and our membership in the church community, we're called to have a new life with Christ. The Holy Spirit bestows new gifts to us through our baptism, which are later perfected through another sacrament. I'll let you guess what that is. Yeah, duh, it's confirmation. It's why we're here. This grace allows us to follow our Lord more closely in discipleship and have hope for our resurrection on the last day. Christ affirms the necessity of baptism. He tells us in John's gospel that unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The church teaches, as we say in the Nicene Creed, that we as Christians believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And it's also like a gateway to a life in the spirit. Since the time of the apostles, the church has traditionally led that the, held that the rite of baptism 
should include the proclamation of the word, acceptance of the gospel, signifying a conversion of sorts, a profession of faith, and finally the actual baptism by which the Holy Spirit washes clean the stain of original sin from the soul of this new Christian. In the early church, there was a lengthy practice of initiation into the church, whereby the uh, person being baptized was taught the truth of the gospel and educated in the faith. This process was concluded with the rite of baptism and the admission into the full communion with the entire church. This meant that the newly baptized was immediately eligible to receive communion. As they had been redeemed in Christ and become a member of the church. Today, the order of this practice has been somewhat altered. Only when one is baptized as an adult can they immediately receive the body and blood of our Lord in the Eucharist. Infants who are baptized still must go through catechesis later in order that they may come to know and believe the faith into which they were baptized. The Eastern Church, so we're, we're the Western Church, But uh, in the East, they do things in a little bit of a different order, which is totally fine. Uh, And they baptize, they confirm, and they administer communion to uh, infants, actually, in the same liturgical ceremony. However, there's still the need for some further catechesis for these spiritual graces to develop their full potential within the life of the individual, like later in life as well. So... They do the same thing, just in a little bit of of a different order. So for an adult to be baptized, he or she must take some steps to prepare. Through this process of being educated in the faith, the future Christian will be able to take complete responsibility and ownership of their beliefs. This is why they make their professions of faith during their baptism. It signifies their conscious beliefs, and therefore it justifies their action of getting baptized. For children and infants, the catechesis is deferred until an age at which the the child is actually able to learn and understand their faith more. And at the time of the liturgical ceremony, the child's parents and godparents make a pledge to teach the, the child about the faith and how to live according to the gospel. So they, they basically make that promise that they're going to get you Uh, educated, that they're going to help you learn about your faith and understand your faith. They make a pledge to do that. For a person to be baptized, they also must not have been previously baptized. Because of that permanent mark left on the soul, there's only need for one baptism in a person's life. This is true in all forms of Christianity who baptize Christians specifically in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All sacraments use real, tangible elements in order to signify the true aspect of this mystery of the sacrament that we may be able to, unable to see. In baptism, there there's, must be the use of uh, ordinary water. And the water does not need to be blessed, actually, believe it or not, Uh, though it almost always is when the baptism is performed in the Catholic Church. There also must be someone who desires to be baptized, or in the case of the infants whose parents desire for them to be baptized, who has not yet been baptized. The pouring of the water over the head of one being baptized or the immersion if uh, they so desire, of the one being baptized, uh, depending on, you know, the particular liturgy, along with the formal words of the sacrament, which are, uh, let's say, Joe is getting baptized. Joe, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Those are those formal words. All of that constitutes a valid baptism. By this very act, sins are literally washed away, and the new Christian is able to receive the kingdom of heaven by their union with Christ. During the rite of baptism, the ordinary minister of the sacrament, the priest or the deacon, 
administers holy chrism. And this oil is the oil of uh, the baptism. And it's only used during the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. And actually every year, all of the priests in the diocese get together and they bless this oil all together. And then every church takes as much as they'll need for the full year. But it's like super duper blessed because (laughs) all of the priests get together and bless it together. It's awesome. But the only time that we use this special oil is for baptism and confirmation. These very special sacraments. At this time, the minister may also lay hands on the person and ask them to explicitly renounce Satan. Oil has actually been used since ancient times to anoint important people. During baptism, the priest anoints the baptized with the chrism to signify the gift of the Holy Spirit, which represents their new life in Christ, who is anointed priest, prophet, and king. By our baptism, we actually get to share in this inheritance as we share in Christ's new life. To show this new life in Christ, uh, we wear a white garment, typically. By the person who's being baptized, it symbolizes that they have put on Christ through their baptism. It symbolizes this being washed clean, like a clean white garment. It's a symbol of purity. And in danger of death, this is wild. I, I learned this while putting this together. In danger of death, one can be baptized by any person if they want to be. Let's say something crazy happens, some really unfortunate accident. And uh, someone decides, because they they think that they may be dying, uh, that they want to be baptized before they die. Well, all the church requires is that uh, this, this person who's administering the sacrament, which could be literally anyone, they're, they're called an extraordinary minister. And that means that they are, you know, not an official, like, clergyman who's doing it, but even the people who pass out uh, communion during Mass, they are extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. That's like their official title. So the church requires that this extraordinary minister of the sacrament use ordinary water and intend to do what the church does in baptism by their own action. So they just have to have the right intention and some water. And the minister must then pour the water upon the person being baptized and use those formal words that I used in order for the baptism to be valid. So Joe I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Very simple. You can memorize that right now should you ever come across a situation where you have to do that for someone. You absolutely should not uh, just go around and baptize all your friends now. Like that is absolutely not what I'm saying. This is only to be done in the most extreme of circumstances. And I pray that you never come across something like this because it sounds... uh, like a tragedy, but it's, it's great to know that, uh, we have that ability to help someone in their last moments enter into the, the family of God. It, it's just, yeah, it's fascinating to me and, a a very interesting thing. So just a fun fact for you, little bonus things you get to learn today. But baptism is, is clearly just It's not just a splash on the head and like a new white outfit. It means so much more. As baptized Christians, we are members of the church. We compose the body of Christ. We're partakers in the new covenant of Jesus. As members of the church, we are given this chance at eternal life. This is a precious gift that we have to try and understand. We're baptized into Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Part of Christ's life into which we are baptized is the life of the priest, prophet, and king, like I previously mentioned. Not only is there a priesthood in the way that we normally think of priests, there's also a common priesthood of believers. In this role, the Christian lives out their baptism through their priestly service in their community. 
as St. Peter's letters instruct you to do, instruct all of us to do. He says, be yourselves built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is why I am so passionate about service hours for you guys learning the importance of serving Christ and serving the community around you because it it is so important it's it's a role it's a responsibility that you've been given as baptized Christians you are supposed to serve the people around you you're supposed to be this common priesthood to the people around you and so it's so important that not only you practice that but you learn that role and that importance because it's the only way that this world can get better is if each of us do a small part, do what we can to make it better. As a Christian, we stand as witnesses to the truth, a light in the darkness of the world. As one who's united to Christ through baptism and through confirmation of soon, We're called to do what is right. This means following directions and being subordinate to our authorities. It means following our authorities, being obedient. To live not only as an upstanding citizen, but as a good and moral follower of Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the light. It's through Christ that we have life at all. And through our baptism that we're brought into new life, better life, by his death and resurrection. In our Christian life, we encounter many reminders of our promise to live in accordance with the truth in the way Christ teaches. Whenever we enter a Catholic church, we dip our fingers into the holy water and bless ourselves like almost routinely. But do we ever stop and think about why we've been taught to do that, why we do that, what that means. It's supposed to, every single time we do it, remind us of our baptismal vows and renew our commitment to Christ. In fact, every time that we make the sign of the cross in general, we acknowledge and affirm our baptismal commitment and new life in Christ. For every Christian, the Easter vigil is almost like the highlight reel of baptismal reminders. That's when adults get to come into the church. They get their baptism. They get their confirmation, their first communion, all in one night. And if you've never been to an Easter vigil, they're super cool and super beautiful. Uh, They are very long because of that, but they're beautiful, and I highly recommend attending at some point. From the baptism to the sprinkling of holy water Christians renew their baptismal promises. Everyone there renews their baptismal promises and vow to live their life according to the teachings of Christ. This renewal is part of the ongoing conversion that each Christian is called to live. Baptism is merely the beginning of our new life. And there are various reminders throughout our life to give us new strength to grow grow closer to our Lord. And lead a holier life. So let's thank the Lord for our baptism. And we're actually going to do something now where we renew our baptismal vows. So I'm going to read something to you. And uh, you can kind of respond as I prompt. At your baptism, your parents and godparents stood around you and not only renewed their own personal baptismal vows, but also spoke on your behalf. At your confirmation, you'll speak on your own accord. You'll renounce the devil and profess your beliefs. Today, we'll remind ourselves that of what we are saying no to, but more importantly, who we are saying yes to. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions And you should confidently respond with, I do. After this renewal, 
uh, I ask that you bless yourself with the sign of the cross. If you have any holy water in your house, uh, then that would be a great time to get a little bit of that and put it on your fingers to do the sign of the cross with. All right, let's start in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you renounce Satan and all his works and empty promises? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered death, and was buried, rose again from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who today, through the sacrament of confirmation, is given to you in a special way, just as he was to the apostles on the day of Pentecost? Do you believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? This is our faith. This is the faith of the church. We are proud to profess it in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you guys for your patience and uh, watching this video a little different this week. I just want you all to know that uh, I'm praying for you. We're all praying for you and hope that we can all continue to live out our baptismal promises in the best way that we can and in leading towards this beautiful sacrament of confirmation. Amen.